So Taylor series reference sheet and then a blank page so that you can just tear it off and bring it with you. And then we have sequences, 9.1. So today we're leaving integrals behind for a moment. Um, and we're going to move on to a new topic for the next four weeks. We've been working with continuous phenomena, things that happen all the time, like water flowing over a dam. For the next few weeks, we're going to focus instead on discrete phenomena, um, things that happened at dis happen at distinct moments in time. There's a lot of vocabulary and notation at the start, so um, stay or get in the habit of using correct notation. So what is a sequence? Um, here's our first example. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, et cetera, et cetera. That's a sequence of numbers. So you can think of this sequence as an infinite ordered list, to just a list of numbers that are in order, have an order. You can also think of a sequence as a function whose domain is the positive integers. The inputs are positive integers. So here's my domain, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and those are my inputs, and then my output or my range right, are the odds. 1 goes to 1, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 5, 4 goes to 7. So we could use standard function notation. If we call this sequence s, we could say s of 1 is 1, s of 2 is 3, etc. But when your domain is the positive integers, it's more common to use um, just a subscript to keep track of the um, input. So the subscript is just a little counter. It just tells you the address of where that number lives in the ordered list of numbers. So S1 is 1, that means the first number in the sequence is 1. S2 equals 3, that means the second number in the list is 3. All right, so take a, a minute or two, find S of 7, S sub 100, and a general term, a formula for S sub n. So S of 7, what is that? Thirteen. How'd you get it? Add two till you get to the seventh number in the list. So we just have to go two more, right? So the sixth number in the list would be eleven, and then thirteen, because you just are adding two every time. And this would be six, seven. Okay. So s of seven is thirteen. Now I don't want to use that same approach to find s sub one hundred because I don't want to have to write out a hundred terms in the list. So how did you figure out S sub 100? Yeah, so you took the 100, double it, and subtract 1. So these numbers in the list are all odds. So a way to build an odd number is to start with an even number, which would be like 2n. And then you can either add 1 or subtract 1, and you'll get an odd. Right? So if I take 1 and double it, I get 2. But I want my output to be 1, so I subtract 1. Right? 2 doubled is 4, subtract 1, you get 3. 3 doubled is 6, subtract 1, you get 5. So I'm going to take my 100 and double it and subtract 1. And then because I was forced to figure out a pattern to answer this question that's really far out in the list, I can write down my general term, S sub n, is always 2 times n minus 1. <clears throat> All right, so just to um, reiterate, the notation S sub 1 means the first term in the list S, and S sub 2 means the second term in the list, and S sub n is called the general term. So we can define a sequence by giving a formula for S sub n. So if we give a general formula, S sub n is 1 plus negative 1 quantity to the n times n. So a definition like this is sometimes called explicit. Let's list the first five terms of this sequence. Actually, why don't you do it? Take a minute. Come up with the first five terms of that sequence. So you're just going to plug in n equals 1, n equals 2, up to 5. All right, I see many of you working on these patterns that are coming up. So we'll just do this first one quickly. S1 means in your formula, replace all your n's with 1's. So this is very much like functions, right? When you first learned functions, except Instead of in having parentheses, uh, we have a subscript. So we're going to have 1 plus negative 1 to the first times 1. So negative 1 to the first is negative 1. 
order of operations says I should do this multiplication first. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. So 1 plus negative 1 is 0. And then S sub 2, we plug a 2 in. We have 1 plus negative 1 squared times 1. So negative 1 squared is 1 times 1 is 1 plus 1 is 2. S sub 3 will be 1 plus negative 1. Oh, I messed this up. That's supposed to be a 2, right? Okay, so that's 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 times 3. Okay, so that's negative 1 times 3 is negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. So that's 5. And then finally, S sub 5, 1 plus negative 1 to the fifth times 5, which would be negative 5 plus 1 is negative 4. All right, does that make sense? Okay, a little bit harder is going backwards, right? So if I give you a list of numbers, can you write a formula for the general term? S sub n. Did anybody come up with anything yet? It kind of looks like what? 2n plus 1. 2 to the n. Okay, so when you're writing formulas, you can always kind of check them, right? Like, let's just do s sub 3. This should give me the third number in the list if I plug in a... So this should be 2 cubed plus 1, which is 9. So minus 1 instead of plus 1. So now I have 2 to the third minus 1, which is 7. It does give me this, the third number in the list. Good. How did you come up with a formula like that, Danny? What? <laughs> well, how did you come up with what you came up with? <laughs> Ryan, how did you come up with this? You, rec you recognize that these were all off from uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Yeah, somebody in computer science would recognize those numbers as powers of 2. Yeah. Um, and you go, oh, it's just one smaller than them. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Ooh, let's look at this next one. Anybody have anything? Not yet. Equal fractions with oh, common denominators. Ooh, uh, I'm not sure. Find the difference. Mm, yeah. Um, um, why don't you explore for a few more minutes? All right, just looking at those three terms, the last three terms in the list, 5 ninths, 6 sixteenths, 7 twenty-fifths. What pattern do you see in the numerators? Yeah, it's 5, 6, 7, right? And what pattern do you see in the denominators? 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared. So that means that we would predict that the previous number, right, would be 4, because I go down one for my numerator, over 2 squared, right? Because this is 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, so I think this would be 2 squared, which is 4. And, oh, that is 1. And if I went backwards in the list again, I would expect this to be 3 over 1 squared, right? 3 over 1. All right, so my numerator, if I put a little counter here to help me, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's the value of n. 
right? So S sub n, my numerator, how is my numerator in the list I wrote down here related to the counter? n plus 2. Yes, we have 1 goes to 3, 2 becomes a 4, 3 becomes a 5, 4 becomes 6, 5 becomes 7. So if my numerator is always going to be the counter plus 2, and then the denominator is the counter squared. That was a tricky one. So see, all the formulas we've been writing so far are called explicit formulas, and they're the kinds of formulas that you're used to working with um, from algebra courses um, and this course thus far. Right? But sequences can also be defined recursively. So here, an equation relates the nth term to the previous terms instead of just relating it to n. We relate it to the previous terms. So you also need to know how the sequence starts. So here's a couple of uh, recursively defined sequences. I'll go through the first one for you so you can get the idea of what this means, and then you can do the next one. So they told us, they had to tell us where to start. S1 is 1. And then S2 would be S sub 2 minus 1, which would be S sub 1 plus 2 to the n, so 2 squared in this case. S sub 1 is 1 plus 4 is 5. Does that make sense? We'll do one more. So S sub 3, okay, according to this formula, S sub 3 should be equal to S sub 2 because 3 minus 1 gives me a 2 plus 2 to the third. So S sub 2, that's 5. 2 cubed is 8, 13. All right, so we'll do the last one of this together, and then you can do the other one yourself. So S4 will be S3 plus 2 to the 4th. So this would be 13 plus 2 to the 4th is 16, 29. Okay, so here's another recursively de defined sequence. Write out the first four terms. All right, what do we got? S1 is 1. What's S2? 2, good. So S2, um, according to this formula, should be 2 times S sub 2 minus 1, which is S sub 1. 2 times 1 is 2. And S sub 3, 6. And S sub 4, say it again, 24. Good, thank you. All right, skipping over the challenge for the moment. A sequence can converge or diverge. So this is just limits from Calc 1. Okay? A convergent sequence is one that approaches a single finite limit as n goes to infinity. Okay? Taking a limit as n goes to infinity, if the sequence approaches a single finite limit, we say that the sequence converges. Otherwise, it diverges. So let's look at just this first one together. Think of it as a function, right? Its inputs are just the positive whole numbers instead of all real numbers. But, um, but you can think of taking the limit in the exact same way. If you let n get really large in this function, say as n goes to infinity, okay, n over n squared plus 4 goes to well, then gets really, really big. Like, think of taking a, a quadrillion, billion, trillion, right? And that's going to be my numerator. And in my de denominator, I'm going to take a quadrillion, billion, trillion and square it, right? That's going to be way, way, way bigger, right? And then this plus four is like this little tiny, doesn't matter at all. It's like a little speck in an infinite universe, right? So the plus four kind of doesn't matter. So this is going to approach n over n squared. The plus 4 is not going to make any difference in the relative sizes of those two numbers. <clears throat> and then n over n squared would re reduce to 1 over n. And as n approaches infinity, what does 1 over n approach? 0. Good. So it's just limits as n goes to infinity. 
So look at the next three and see if you can predict um, if it's convergent and if it does converge, what it converges to. So we will say this converges to zero. Okay, so let's look at the cosine of pi n over n. Remember, our inputs are just positive whole numbers. So sometimes, or often, you know, it can help to just write out the first several terms to get a, a better uh, sort of intuitive feeling about what this sequence is doing. So the cosine of pi is negative 1 over 1. So negative 1 for S1. S2, cosine of 2 pi is 1. So this one's going to be 1 over 2, which is a half. And S3, so now I'm going to be taking the cosine of 3 pi, which is negative 1. I get negative 1 third. S4, cosine of 4 pi is 1. I get a fourth. And S5, I get negative 1 fifth. So what do you, what's happening? What's going to happen as, as the n goes to infinity? It's going to approach 0. It's bouncing around 0, right? It's going negative, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. But each time, it's still getting closer to 0. So S sub n is approaching 0. And so we would say that one converges to 0. OK, what's different about B and D? Right, D also kind of bounces around, right? So S1 would be 4 and S2 would be 6, and S3 would be 4, and S4 would be 6. And it just bounces 4, 6, 4, 6, 4, 6, 4, 6. But can I say that that's converging? It never gets closer to anything. It's just constantly bouncing between 6 and 4. So this one we have to say diverges. Right? It has to approach a single finite limit. So this one's bouncing around, but it's bouncing around zero and getting closer to zero every time. And then what about C? What happens as n goes to infinity there? It diverges, because the whole thing is going to go to infinity. Good. Um, Skipping the challenge for now. You can prove that a sequence converges without having to figure out what it converges to, right? So this should sound familiar, right? like the area under a uh, improper integral. You can show a sequence converges if you can show that it's bounded, right? There's some number it never gets bigger than, and monotone. Okay, so monotone means always increasing or always decreasing. Okay, so if you can show a function is always increasing and it's bounded above, right? So let's try to picture increasing and bounded above. So I have, here's my, here's my bound, right? My function never gets bigger than, than some bound. Okay. And from underneath it, I have to draw a function that is always increasing, right? It never stops increasing. So I'll have, you know, it's a sequence, so it's not continuous. So I'm just putting points instead of a line, but always increasing, but never getting bigger than that upper bound has to approach a limit. And then there's another analogous, always decreasing and bounded below. So if you've got some lower bound and your function is always decreasing but can never go lower than that bound, you know, sort of no matter how it does it, it has to approach a limit. 
Okay, so if you can show that a sequence is bounded and monotone in either direction, you can, you can know that it converges. All right, so here's an interesting sequence, 0 0.19, 0 0.19191919, 0.19191919, 0 0.19191919. So each time I move up in the sequence, I add another 1,9 to my decimal. This is what is meant by the notation 0.19 repeating forever. This is how we figure out what that equals. We look at a sequence where you keep adding a 0.19 at each step. Okay. Does it converge? So I'm not trying to figure out what it converges to. Just does it converge? Does that, that sequence of 0.19 Point one nine one nine, point one nine one nine one nine, etc. Does it converge to something? How do you know? <laughs> Very clever. Yeah, it's bounded above. By point two, right? So adding decimals to the end, it will never get bigger than point two. And is it always increasing? Yeah. Every time I add a little bit to the end, right, I'm increasing the value of that number by a small amount, right? So it's bounded above by 0.2, and it's always increasing. So yes, it converges. And next class, we'll be able to figure out what it converges to. Does anybody happen to know what it converges to? What 0.9 repeating equals as a fraction? 0.19 repeating? Don't ask your calculator. That's okay. You'll you'll be you get to be blown away next class. Something to look forward to. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave you to do a little bit of work um, in Adventures in Fibonacci Land, and I'll come around and help. This is um, pretty cool and interesting, and you probably won't ever see it um, in your standard STEM math courses, so um, have fun. Okay, so this is one way to prove that a sequence converges, right? And But just because this is may not necessarily be true doesn't mean that the sequence doesn't converge, right? We have like certain ways because there are, so the pictures I drew, right, bounded above and increasing forces it to a limit and bounded below and decreasing forces your sequence to a limit. But I could have a function that converges to say zero that's not bounded above and increasing or bounded below and decreasing like that cosine of n pi over n problem, right? It went like this. Right? So it's certainly not always increasing, right? Because it switches, it goes decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing. And so it does not satisfy this bounded above and increasing or bounded below and decreasing, but it still converges. So this is just one way that we have to think about if a sequence happens to fulfill this, we know it converges. Okay, but there are, doesn't mean it doesn't converge if it doesn't fulfill this.